go to a restaurant in China, nobody's talking to each other unless they've got a few beers. So is that, that number startled a bit, it's quite high. Yeah. Well, first of all, it's 600 million of smartphone users and 500 of mobile gaming users. So that includes feature code. That's 500 million of uh, 1.2 billion. But I, I can, I'm pretty confident to say just smartphone users will be close to, will be way above 100 million, yeah, for sure. So it, that is definitely a high penetration of gaming users. But at least we still have another half of the market to grow from 600 million to 1. But out of those 500 million, how many actually pay for a game? <laughs> well, By having, you know, 502 million? That, I don't have the exact number in my head, but so I'm, I ask you more difficult questions than that Korean bloke. So I should be a VC. So I'm just curious, I'm just curious, because obviously you're getting the downloads, one thing, getting to pay and another thing. So I mean, the, the numbers in China are always huge. So your, your thing about becoming international, I like that idea, I like going to the fact you're into NASDAQ. But once you've left America, do they still pay attention to you? I mean, what you did was quite risky, because A, you listed before Alibaba, and now all the attention has gone to Alibaba, and all the other shares have tanked for a while. So what do you think? I mean, do, do you think Nasdaq pays attention to China and gaming, or is it more about e-commerce and all this? Are they getting, is it, you know, one, one by one, or can they deal with it all of it at the same time? Well, I, I, I'm actually quite surprised, you know, when I went to the US, a lot of the analysts, a lot of these big funds are actually Chinese. Okay. You know, including like, companies like Piper, uh, Granite Point, Falcon and I, they're all Chinese. Chinese, right? Or Chinese? Like Chinese, Chinese. You know, they, they actually try to make in Chinese. So were you doing your pitches in Mandarin? Yes. Actually, actually, uh, I thought like, because we, we, we did a roadshow in Singapore, and then Hong Kong, and then we did a roadshow in the US. in US. So for Singapore, I would say 70% of the, the, the presentation was done by my CEO, my hope, because he didn't speak Mandarin. Hong Kong, I was helping him a little, little bit. And then when we got on the flight, we were saying like, ah, now I get to rest because it's all American. So I, 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 I can't speak, so you know, it's all you. Yeah. And then uh, after we land, our banker showed us the, 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 the meeting schedule, and then I'm like, well, actually, a lot of the meeting are Chinese. Actually, 50% of my meeting is in Mexico, not, not, not English. So, so tell us about, right, so that if you're distributing to China, how do you then turn that around to distribute to other markets. I mean, a lot of the companies, I had six waves come and speak here, right? In those days, what they were doing, they saw a niche to distribute games in Chinese, in Russian, in Portuguese, whatever, into Latin America, etc. So do you see an opportunity to then go, okay, I'll go into the Middle East, I'll go into Latin America, I'll go to where the Americans and the Europeans are not very good at entering? No, not only that, you know, we're going to Japan, we're going to Korea, uh, we want to uh, America also. So, you know, a lot of Chinese developers want to go to this, this market, and we want the Chinese developer also. Um, and a lot of our American uh, developers want to get to Japan and Korea also. So, you know, of course, you know, I'm not going to publish an American game in American soil, they don't need me for that. So, because my partners uh, in Andrew's guy, I have Koreans, I have Japan, I have Russians, I have uh, Europeans, I have Chinese. You know, what I'm helping them is like, hey, you know, if I help you to distribute your game in America because you're a Chinese developer, maybe I can also help you to distribute in Europe. Or well, if you're an American developer, since I'm helping you in China, maybe I can also help you in Japan and like Korea. So you're a middleman. It's yeah. typical Hong Kong. Excellent. Yes. So tell us, uh, and then, okay, the publisher, do you then start making your own games? And if you're making your own games, are you making them in China or are you making them in Vietnam? or other markets, because it seems to me that, as you were saying, anywhere in the world now you can make a game, right? There's creative designers, there's developers. Are you just focusing on Chengdu, where they have, you know, animation studios? Well, what's your thoughts there? Well, you know, actually, I can tell uh, one of the reasons why uh, our IPO was so successful was we are a pure publishing model. We don't develop ourselves. So it's so much easier to explain. Our, our, our auditing is so much easier. Our perspective is higher. But actually, prop margin is lower than being a developer. Because you only get like, you know, anywhere from 10 to 15% of it. If you're a developer, you can get a lot more. 
Um, but because we're a pure publisher, you know, our portfolio is also very diverse. You know, as a developer, you make a lot of games, two games every year. I publish like 30 games every, every year. And, you know, my, my main revenue is three to five to six games. So it's much easier to also explain to, to bankers and, uh, and investors. Um, now, what we do is we do invest in development in China. Oh, if we actually recently made an investment in America on the developer that is uh, making it. So, so is that what you, what have you, actually there's a question I was going to ask you. You've raised 115 million US, right? Yeah. So you gave 15 million US back to the investors. <laughs> what do you do with the remaining 100? What you, is that, are you using that to buy companies? Are you using that to buy advertising? I mean, it's an expensive game. Are you using, what are you using it for? Well, uh, the use of proceeds, you know, uh, there's a couple of things that we're using it for. One is uh, we're actively investing in a technology company that can help us better understand our, uh, better understand our big data. Uh, we're investing in companies uh, that are using to uh, give us a more healthy uh, pipeline. Of, uh, uh, pipeline. We're also investing in uh, uh, foreign companies so we can actually expand globally. Um, that's the three main, 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 main so uses. So you've got big data, right? So you're starting to, what, what kind of data are you analyzing? Because I know in Hong Kong there's quite a lot of people in the big data space, right? Is this more behavioral or advertising data? Or does this data help you design these games? Or is it big data around, well, if they've downloaded this, they're going to like this? Right? Well, what kind of data are you looking at? Well, in-house we have built all those data already. Advertising, behavioral, uh, uh, cross-promotion, uh, and information uh, and stuff. Uh, we have all that, but we're also investing, like, we were also investing in a company that can build us more technology on, you know, for forecasting what's going to happen in the future. Um, giving us more uh, uh, a glimpse of what is going to happen in the market. Um, especially with uh, over 100 million I mean, uh, active users, it gives us a lot of capability to do that. Um, yeah. But isn't, isn't the game industry a bit like Hollywood, that forecasting the success of a game is like forecasting the success of a movie, except the difference is in a movie, you can get some stars. Right? I, don't, I don't think you can do that to get Super Mario movie. I don't know, can you do the same in the game industry? Can you go, well, you know, we've got this franchise, we'll do, you know, Temple One 532. I mean. Yeah, you know, so for example, one of the things that we did in Temple Run is, uh, you know, in Temple Run you have characters. And uh, we start thinking like, hey, what can we do else in Temple Run? So we start like thinking like, oh, why, why don't we add a, add a Chinese celebrity, right? Then we're like, which to add? There's like hundreds and millions of them. And we're like, well, let's look at our data. Um, are, are they more male-centric or are they more female-centric? Male-centric, okay. What age group? Uh, what kind of, uh, of occupation? Eventually, we uh, decided to uh, work on a, uh, a science celebrity in China called Yu, Liu, uh, which is kind of an uh, up-and-coming hot model in China. And we sell, she's selling like hot cakes, like we sell, we sell her like around six, six dollars a pop. And over the past six, over the past six months, we've sold over like three million of our characters. Six million yes. That's interesting. So your data, you're using your data to introduce new characters into the game. Features. features. So if, if the men like Ada, Ada Liu, yeah. what do the women like? That? I need to go back and ask my, my, my analyst team. But uh, what we're also doing now is we, we, we're also uh, adding like, we, one, one, one thing that we realize is also a lot of them are the Taku, like anime fans. So that's why I applied to Japan right, uh, last week on top of the anime, animation company on uh, requiring animation characters to play Taku Fight. Interesting. So what you're doing is you're basically turning Temple Run into a platform that you just introduce new characters to. Very interesting. So uh, let's take some questions from the floor. You'd be a great audience. Anybody got a question? I'm going to have to roam with the microphone. Is there only got one? Ah, all right. How are you going to do this? Maybe you scream when he comes. <laughs> What's your question? Um, I, I just kind of want to know what, uh, how do you decide what games to take on? And um, does any game that approach you uh, basically can access to your platform or whatever you like? Can we just repeat that? So your question was? Yes, every... <laughs> so, so what kind of like due diligence do you go through on terms of onboarding the game onto the distribution platform? And um, um, so like, I mean like, this, 
basically what I'm asking is that everything um, comes to you and then you can help them to distribute the traffic. So the question is, what do we have to do in order to get on this platform? Yes. Well, back in the distribution days, I do have one. But now, as a publisher, uh, as a publisher, you know, we actually spend money on the game, then we become selected. Um, actually, we do a lot of due diligence. Uh, roughly, right now, a month, we get around anywhere from 600 to 700 uh, applications of uh, games. That's say, like how many do for from in China? And this is six. This is from all over the world. They're a bit like Invest Hong Kong, right? This, this doing applications to start me up. So, uh, what are your, how do you decide? I mean, do you have any, I mean, you know, when you go to all investors, they go, I only invest in consumers, I only invest in. So do you have categories? How do you decide? So actually, uh, every quarter, our company uh, our analytic team come to us and say like, you know, what kind of category of things we're missing, or what kind of category of things we see more potential in. Uh, that is one of uh, 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 insight for us, so we pick games. If it's a game that is in the category that we're interested, of course we have a more a higher priority to evaluate and look at the game. But at the end of the day, like like I always say, like it's about is your game is it is a good right? Um, it, have your game been launched in other market and have already good result? Um, it's your, uh, we look at the game from a graphical angle, from a technical angle, from an operation angle. Uh, we also look at the background of the game developer. Have you produced hit before? You know, if you haven't produced hit before, uh, how long have you spent time developing the game? Uh, what's the game quality? Um, have you have any experienced game developer that we did before? And what kind of game they make? These are all kind of the, 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 the things that we look into when we select the game. Excellent. Good answer. And any other questions? I come back to you. Hello, sir. Hello. So, one simple question. <laughs> if you have it to do all over, don't say you do it all over, but what would you do? That's that's a simple question. That wasn't an ice bucket challenge question. If you have to do more all over. He knows. You can answer whatever you want. Right. Like you just think about it whilst, whilst we take the next question. Yes, to think about it. Because that's slightly philosophical. <laughs> and he needs another beer in order to talk. Very simple. Question is simple. Answer no. Wait, 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 wait. I uh, said so thank you for coming today. And uh, my question for you is this. So it sounds like the model that you have is kind of like an agency model, right? And you were able to initially get into China because you had a lot of connections. Uh, my imagination is that but once you get into that and just kind of establish this kind of model, people will try to mine it for it, try to imitate you. How are you able to actually maintain your edge and to sort of continue attracting uh, you know, gamers, to come, uh, gamers and developers to come to you? And why would people particularly want to do it for you uh, to the extent that you're able to actually take your company back to it? Because I would imagine the competition in China is very, very fierce. I bet you ask that question when you're on the road in America. It sounds like a banker question. Are you okay? There you go. So basically you're saying what makes you unique? Yeah. So, you know, as a... Basically, I'm a middleman, like our agency. Uh, in the middle of a value chain, uh, what, we, what, what we pride ourselves on is not only as a publisher, all we do is you give me your game. I put money in it and market it for you, I tell you what to do, I, uh, and then you change yourself. But what Item Sky have really invented is actually we take source code from our developers. If, even if it's company like EA or this. A developer's willing to give you source code? I thought that was like a crown jewel. It's like me giving you my child. <laughs> Will you take my child? <laughs> so do you feed it and pay for its schooling? Well, Actually, um, that's the uniqueness of Hydro Sky. Every single game that we publish, we have source code access to it. And we actually do all the development work for them in China. So you're, what you're saying is that you're more than just publishing it, you're actually localizing it more than on a, on a kind of linguistic yep. side. Yep. You're also localizing in terms of maybe some of the behavior, yep. some of the interaction. Yep, monetization, everything. So actually, because of that, it makes us more like a development problem. For, public, uh, for developer uh, that is working for Iron Sky. Now, for distribution channel, they see Iron Sky as a gigantic developer, not as a publisher anymore, because 
we can actually make the development work of any things that is in our portfolio. Now, it's very hard to imitate our model because we've not been trusted by small developers. We've been trusted by indie developer to gigantic global conglomerate business. Now, people have been trying to imitate me, but what, what they find is very hard to do is who to trust at the first. Especially if you're a Chinese company asking for an American to trust you with the source code, it's very, very tricky. And we, we, we got into this business at the very right moment when developers are not that big yet. Now, developers are so big now, they're like, no, 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 I'm not going to give you source code unless you tell me who has given me the source code. Now, items that we can tell, like, well, this will give you source code. <laughs> yeah, give me source code, so who are you? Um, that's the first thing. Second thing is, you know, since uh, 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 since the very first day of doing publishing, we embedded our own SDK into all of the game we publish. For so somebody who doesn't know, what is the SDK stand? Uh, software Development Kit. So actually, by embedding our uh, software development kit, we're able to analyze our user. We're able to cross-promote on our user. So we have accumulated 100 million MAU, which we can cross-promote from. So it gives us a, 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 a big uh, uh, advantage uh, across other publishers where to them, when they publish a game, they need to spend hard-earned money on every single user acquisition. With me, I can actually just publish it through my uh, cross-promote the new game that I'm publishing to my own users. So what you're doing is you're a bit like Flurry, right? For these guys. So you, you basically created your own yep. in-app ad network. Yep. Interesting. Awesome. Did that answer your question? That was two hands up, yes. Uh, he's going to answer the philosophical. Are you ready for the philosophical answer? Yeah. No, he's yeah. Not. Let's leave that for, for the last. Later, later. Okay. No, tell his hand went up first. Sorry. Hi, uh, sounds like that you uh, really understand your market well. Uh, it's more of a fun question. I was wondering, was there ever a game where you guys were sure that it would be a complete success and it flopped? Or vice versa, if there wasn't anything like that. Was there ever a game where you thought um, you gave it a chance and it became one of your biggest selling games? No. Good question. Jeff used to be a proud young man. Now he's a bit, you know, he's a father, so he's a bit more mellow, so he'll probably be honest. I support the key. <laughs> yes, there, there's definitely games that we love to the game. The next block, triple A blockbuster, and he's dead now. I think that's, that's, that's what happens to every publisher or even investor. Um, you know, there's this one game that I hold very. Uh, Close emotion to is uh, it's actually called back in, back in 2011. After that, they made a game called Weeks. Uh, it's recently a kind of popular game to me. Um, and back then, when I played the first game back in, I was like, oh my god, this is such a genius game. You know, it's kind of like Tetris. But instead, you have like all these grocery items that you put in your bag, and you need to fit them within the bag. Right? And I thought the game was good. I even showed it to my operation team. They're like, oh, this game is good. And it's also showing signs of ranking in China and in the US. I was like, oh, this game is going to work. Um, the game that I just mentioned that's made by Seasoft, Go Outside War, I actually remember that I showed it to my guys, and my guys like, this is a C game. Yeah. We're not doing C games anymore. And I'm like, well, but, you know, it's from a good friend of mine in Hong Kong. And actually, what happened in that game was, because it's, uh, it's an IP from China, and actually that cartridge is going to air in China back then, so I was like, you know guys, they're not asking for a lot. This IP is going to air in China, so we don't get a lot of marketing noises. Uh, they're willing to put our, game, uh, our company logo at the end of the cartoon. And I'm like, this cartridge is going to air in 50 TV channel, even including CCTV or all the big, big TV stations. And I'm like, you know, what they're asking for, even if we lose all that money, the marketing opportunity that we get is bigger than it. So the guy's like, well, you're the co-founder, you're the president, if you want to sign, you can sign. So I'm like, yeah, I'm signing. So I signed it. And then like when we launched, it became a phenomenal. Like nobody even thought it was going to be that big. Like so, it definitely, there are, there are chances that, you know, we thought it's not going to get the company. So how, how much your analytics that you talked about earlier, how much they help you define whether it's going to be a hit or a bit, and how big a hit it's going to be, right? Yeah. 
are the, are, are the analytics that clever? I mean, it is humans you're studying to, right? Humans are not always predictable. So, I mean, how much do analytics play a role in saying this is going to be a big hit? I think analytic is, 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 if you start using analytic for every decision you make, then you won't fail. Especially in the gaming business, because gaming business is also kind of a hard form. Uh, that's why analytics for, for us is all, always something for us to reference on, for us to make a more educated guess. But at the end of the day, when you work, when, when we pick games, like in, in, in the uh, in Iron Sky, how we pick games is, you know, we have the analytics to do the to do a report, and then we have our operation team, marketing people to do an in-depth report that the analytics show is already kind of like, yeah, it's doable. But at the end of the day, it comes down to the three core values, where to us, we don't really even look at the report, and we just say like, yeah, let's do it. Yeah, let's not do it. Like even the report can be like all A's, all flying color, but if three co-founder out of three, there's one that is a like, I hate the game, not doing it. But you're three guys, right? So are you a fair reflection of the market in China of people who buy games? I don't think we're the fair reflection. Three guys can never be a fair reflection of the market, but for us, it's more important that we are working on game. As a game company, I always say like it's more important that you work on game that you believe. If one of us don't believe in the game, then the company is not going to push all the resources that we, we don't push. It's important for us to believe in the game, so we'll put every single resource that we do and, and make sure that the game will realize its true potential. But gaming, is gaming not like, you know, Procter & Gamble? I mean, Procter & Gamble, when they, before they launch a new shampoo, whatever, they'll test it on people. Do you, do you go out and have like a test group? Do you have test groups around China that you say, well, try this out? Yeah, we do. We do a lot of post beta testing. And through those post beta testing, then we look at like, how can we refine tune the game? How can we change the game further? Um, some games typically, like some games will take like anywhere from nine months in close beta. We, we test it on like, you know, people in Hunan, we test it on people in like uh, Guangzhou, we test, we, that's, that's also the value of our data because we have such a big user base. We can, we, we're able to reach to this user and say, hey, you want to test a game? So you want to test a game for us, we'll give you like some uh, free credit to play as all our games. Excellent. There's a question here, right? This is another thing. Um, I just want to ask, um, um, I think you answered that earlier, but basically you said you were doing, they're doing advertising across their uh, users, but if you want to expand upon that. Well, so what we do is we first use our own traffic, um, and then we also, if we need more, then we also buy traffic from advertising firm. We also work with advertising firm on advertising their their uh, their brand in our game, but we're very strict with that, we don't advertise game in our game. We never try to advertise another game companies here in our game, they're not public for us. So we do ever recently we did a big advertising campaign uh, in China with this and uh, on the new uh, line of four wheel. Uh, and last year we did a big advertising campaign in Central. So are you making money also by uh, in-game advertising or is this something that doesn't really exist? It's just media talk. Well actually we do make some advertising revenue, but to us it's more important, both in the Central campaign and the Adidas campaign, for us it's more of a reward for our user. We don't want to give our user like buy and use shoes. What we did was, you know, take Fruit Ninja, and then what we do is like, you slash 500 Fruit, you slash Fruit Ninja, and uh, when we're doing the campaign, you get this like special event and say like, if you slash more than 2,000 Fruit in this week, right, uh, you are entitled for a 20% off coupon for the new run. So it's, at the end, it's still advertisement, but for user point of perspective, it doesn't feel that much of advertisement. Because as we know, like, game, game or game, like, the like bad and they just keep rolling on their watch on the bottom of the screen. I, I have a question that I've been thinking about. Is in China, as companies like Xiaomi 
Lenovo, TCL, Huawei, they're all launching their own mobile phones, right? Do, are they, would they become the dominant players in terms of distribution? I mean, rather than have 300 websites or you know, markets, is it much smarter to go and broker a deal with Lenovo and Huawei and those guys and just have your games embedded? And when I buy the phone, I can't be shy to buy the games. I just want them on my phone. Right? Is that, is that where it's going? I'm just curious the direction it's going. Well, actually, preloading in China doesn't really work, um, especially in the smartphone days. I mean, back in the feature phone days, it worked really well because there's no app store on the feature phone. So whatever is preloaded, you pay for that. Um, but in smartphone, you know, people actually, like, even you preload a game, they don't really care because they will go to the app store download. Second thing is game updates so often, you preload your game. When you give the, your, your, your game to the companies, and from the, the manufacturer to sell the device to the user is typically around a six month gap, which means your game is already updated like 60 times already. So when, when the user starts playing your game, it's probably going to say like, you need to update the game. The last thing that makes preload very hard in China is, in China there's people call post loading. So like for example, Lenovo will sell to a wholesaler. This wholesaler might have wiped the Lenovo and post load them with other apps that he's selling this long. And this post load, this wholesaler might sell to like a Hunan post uh, wholesaler, which again he do his own wiping again. And this Hunan wholesaler will sell it to this like agency that works with this ten mom and pop shop, and they post load again. So preload actually doesn't really work. In the Any one more question? Anyone? No. So that's the existential question. Are you ready to answer yeah. this? You could have a good answer after this one. If you had a chance, how would you do this all over again? Is that the only question? So, uh, if I have to do this all over again, uh, there's two things I would do. One, I would hire a very, I, I would start with a damn good HR. I damn good what? HR. Human resource manager. Like, one of the, the big things that I think I'm going through right now is talent acquisition challenge. Like, I can't believe like now like for, for me right now the biggest challenge is having that position. So if I have a damn good job right from the start, there will be so much mistake that I could have avoided. Um, the second thing that I would do if I start this all over again is I will groom more people. Like throughout my, my, my whole phase of building my group sky, I've been focusing on getting the best stuff. And I thought that was the right track, but now after IPO, I'm like realizing like, oh my god, I have so much work to do because I haven't done anything. Um, so that's all the second. So that's, that's the two things that I will do do it all with you. Good answer. Man. That's ah. the kind of question that everybody in Hong Kong has a business Wonderful. is facing. <laughs> right? right? Who has a business in this in this room who's looking for people? Who's grooming them or doesn't have time to groom their people? Go on, be honest. What on this about that? All right, anyway, that was very good. Thank you. That was a very good interview. You were very honest. I appreciate it. <laughs> Round of applause. Yeah. All right, so, uh, Jenny, Jenny, uh, could, could somebody get the name cards from the girl at the door? Ben, uh, so now's the moment you've been waiting for. You get one of these. Uh, what is this? <laughs> this is a Food Ninja Plush boy. All right, so we've got some prizes. Oh. I'm going to tell you what this one is. Uh, no. This is another Fruit Ninja bomb. It actually makes Fruit Ninja sound. That's it. Okay, and what's this? This, this is uh, a hydrogen sky portable battery that won't explode. I thought you would do a battery that won't explode for those of you who are silly enough to buy the latest iPhone. So we're going to do a lucky draw then, guys. We're going to go backwards. So we're going to do maybe, uh, we'll do, let's say, we'll do, what, four, right? So we take some photos. We'll start with the, the fourth, and the, the grand prize will be the $850 Social Media Matters event, okay? So let's start backwards here, right? I'm going to uh, close your eyes, and we'll go for, you get a plush toy, just a plush toy, right? Plush toy. Actually, we'll, we'll do three. Okay. So the first winner looks like like a London Underground tube ticket. Uh, Mark, uh, Mark, 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 Mark,
He left anyway. He left? Alright, got the hollow. He's not hollow enough to sleep. Oh, yeah. Thanks, okay. No, I'll give him three seconds. Daniel Chan from Excite Pass. Oh, he's here, excellent. Oh, nice right. Nice toy. Nice toy and a battery. Nice toy and a battery. Nice toy and a battery.